Century of Lights. We've had to postpone doing new episodes for a while. Uh, Real life intervened, um, specifically my PhD dissertation, but to the four or five people who listen to this podcast, welcome back. This time, I want to talk about Catherine the Great, a more well-known enlightened despot. She was a politically powerful woman who nonetheless felt free to live a sexually liberated lifestyle that seems impossible even for an elite woman of her time. But her life does show that reality can be stranger than fiction. I also want to show that Catherine, just by being who she was, demonstrated how messy the Enlightenment was, brewing together the ideal of absolute rule by benevolent autocrat with a growing sense of egalitarianism and the power of public opinion, a mixture that in the end turned out to be unsustainable. Catherine wasn't born into the Russian imperial family. Even her name was different then. She was born as Sophie in an obscure German princely family whose main claim to fame was that they were related to the Swedish royal family. At least according to her memoirs, which were written in the frank style of Rousseau's Confessions, she was ambitious even as a child and dreamed of marrying a prince, although for the crown, not the prince himself. She was also very precocious. Her memoirs claim that when she was very young, she got into several arguments with her Lutheran tutor, once because she refused to accept that Marcus Aurelius and the other great pagans of history were burning in hell, once because she really wanted to know what things looked like before God created the universe, and one more time because the tutor refused to tell her what circumcision meant. There's a good chance that she might have ended up married off to some obscure German prince and today just being a name on a list on Wikipedia or elsewhere. Instead, the forces of the European marriage market worked out in her favor. After converting to the Orthodox Church, an act that changed her name from Sophie to Catherine, she was married to the Grand Duke Peter, the nephew and heir of Empress Elizabeth I of Russia. Unfortunately, Peter was not very bright, hardly a match for his new wife. He, he was horribly scarred by smallpox and liked to talk nonstop about his toy soldiers. In Catherine's own words, I cannot say that I either liked him or disliked him. I was taught to obey, and it was my mother's business to see about my marriage. But, to tell the truth, I believe that the crown of Russia attracted me more than his person. Even by the standards of loveless matches, their marriage was a miserable one. Peter preferred sleeping with women other than his wife, and, weirdly enough, enjoyed giving her all the juicy details of his conquests. He was also paranoid, bringing Catherine before the Empress and her ministers in a kangaroo court where she was accused of writing incriminating letters to foreign courts. This could have led her being shipped back to Germany, shut up in a convent or even killed. She faced down the accusations, even though they probably weren't entirely wrong. But the real problem was that Catherine had no heir. Her chief attendant, Maria Choglikov, may have been operating from the instructions of Empress Elizabeth herself when she took Catherine aside, saying, Listen to me, I must really talk to you about this quite frankly. I was naturally all ears and eyes. She started in her usual way with a long dissertation on her affection for her husband, on her wisdom, on what had and had not to be done to secure love and facilitate conjugal relations, and then suddenly declared that there were certain situations of major importance which formed exceptions to this rule. I let her say all she had to say without interrupting, unaware of what she was aiming at, slightly surprised and wondering if she was setting a trap for me or whether she was sincere. While I was Deliberating this, she added, You will see how much I love my country and how frank I can be. I have no doubt that in your heart you have a certain preference for one man over the other. I leave you to choose between Sergei Saltikov or Leo Narishkin, and if I am not mistaken, it is the latter. 
Catherine later pretty much spells out that the father of her child was Sergei Saltikov, not Peter Romanov. It probably comes as no surprise that published copies of Catherine's memoirs were heavily censored until the fall of the Russian monarchy in the 20th century. Even though he was already unpopular, Catherine's husband became Tsar Peter III of Russia, but his reign only lasted six months. Carefully cultivating both popular support and powerful backers, Catherine deposed Peter III and took the Russian throne in her own name, and not the name of her son Paul. Imprisoned in a fortress, Peter would be strangled by his jailer, who happened to be Catherine's lover at the time. Catherine's reign may have had a brutal start, but over the years she turned herself into a celebrity of the Enlightenment, promising more humane, progressive governance. Unfortunately, she ran into the same paradox that her predecessor Peter the Great did. How does one combine the principles of the Enlightenment, particularly its ideas about greater equality, with the fact that Russia was run by an autocracy seen as backwards by all of Europe? Catherine's lifestyle did not help matters. She kept one love her lover most of her life, Grigory Potemkin, but he supplied Catherine with male lovers who were paid off handsomely once she grew tired of them. The Enlightenment, which really never had much of a notion for a sexual revolution, especially not for women, was not receptive to such a woman. At best, Catherine's sex life was grounds for still seeing Russia as a delightfully eccentric but undeniably backwards country. Never mind that Catherine herself was technically German. Still, Catherine had read the works of Diderot, Rousseau, the Brothers Grimm, and others. As Empress, she did make a real effort to put the principles of the Enlightenment into practice. In fact, she even put her life on it. In sorry contrast to certain people today, she had herself vaccinated against smallpox, at a time when even few doctors supported vaccination. She explicitly drew from Montesquieu to reform and modernize Russia's law code. She promoted religious tolerance, even allowing settlements with mosques to be built in the empire's Muslim-majority lands with state funds. And finally, she established a public school system open to anyone. Well, except serfs, but we'll get to that. When Voltaire died, she brought his library. In one letter, she declared, It is he, or rather his works, who formed my mind and taught me to think. She never vo met Voltaire in person. She did get to meet one of her idols, Diderot, but they were both quickly disillusioned. When Diderot came at the Empress's invitation to St. Petersburg, he thought Catherine wanted him as a minister. So he gave her a questionnaire that had 88 items, from the amount of tar supplied by each of the empire's provinces to how veterinary colleges were organized. He wrote a treatise on what Catherine should do with her empire, which she quietly ignored. When Diderot returned to France, though, he was still filled with praise for the empress he compared to Julius Caesar. One of the issues Diderot and the female Caesar fell out over was that of serfs. Serfdom, the practice of binding peasants to the land they toiled on, had long mostly died out in most of Europe, leaving only a few traces here and there. In Russia, it not only survived in full, but became more restrictive to the point that it was comparable to slavery. In 1782, 6.7 million people, about half of the male population of the entire Russian Empire, were serfs. That 6.7 million people who could not leave the lands they worked on, who could be traded between landowners like cattle, who were completely barred from the public education system Catherine had established, who could be punished by their landowners, who were only restricted from imposing the death penalty, and who could not even marry without the landowner's permission. In his biography of Catherine the Great, Henri Troyat gives a couple of newspaper classifieds from her day involving the sale of serfs. Here's one. For sale, a hairdresser and, in addition, four bedsteads and other down and other pieces of furniture. Early in her reign, Catherine did think about abolishing serfdom, and Diderot certainly urged her to do so, but she did not dare take such a step. The most she would do is not allow serfdom to be established in the new territories conquered by the Russian Empire. 
Instead, later on, she indulged in the system. As part of her usual retirement package for her lovers, she would give away entire villages and hundreds and thousands of serfs, alongside money and property. The hypocrisy there was not even Catherine's greatest betrayal of the Enlightenment, at least as far as her admirers in France and Germany were concerned. Catherine erased from the map a country that had existed for centuries, Poland. She had put one of her lovers, Stanislaw Poniatowski, on the Polish throne, but Poniatowski disappointed her by actually taking his job seriously, and pursuing reforms meant to save Poland from its hungry neighbors. In spite of his best efforts, she, along with the rulers of Prussia and Austria, carved up Poland between each other in a series of acts until there was nothing left. Even in a time known for real politics, the partition shocked people by just how much of a naked grab for territory it was. Diderot was reluctant to make too much of a public nuisance over the issue, afraid to alienate his patron, but he did write that the partition was an offense against humanity. But there were some apologists, like Catherine's other cheerleader Voltaire, who took the fact that the Catholic government of Poland had been cracking down on Protestants and twisted the partitions of Poland into a victory for religious tolerance. But Catherine's real break with the Enlightenment happened to be the French Revolution. She was not eager to see her own son, a fanatical reactionary, succeed her, but she was horrified even by the early stages of the Revolution, when Louis XVI was forced to become a constitutional monarch, she wrote to Grimm, When you return to Paris, take a rod to these schoolboys who are advising the king of France and give them a good whipping if they are not hanged yet. Nor was she pleased that her grandson and preferred successor, Alexander, turned out to be more of a freethinker than she would have liked, so much so that he despaired of ruling over a primitive autocracy like Russia's and fantasized of leaving Russia to lead a private life in Switzerland. However, Alexander understood the problems with being an absolute ruler and being a true child of the Enlightenment more than his grandmother did. Now, even though the American and French revolutions were inspired by it, the Enlightenment itself wasn't really all that democratic. Most of the people perpetuating the Enlightenment were aristocratic, or at least were wealthy middle class, and none advocated overthrowing monarchies. Today's categories of liberal and conservative, left and right, even republican and monarchist, didn't really exist before the French Revolution. And it is possible if events toward the 18th century had flowed just a little bit differently, so-called enlightened despotism, instead of representative democracy, might have ultimately become the desired norm or at least a more mainstream idea than it turned out to be. The ideas of the Enlightenment could have, and were, used to support both representative democracy and enlightened despotism. But the French Revolution did happen the way it did, and it made the philosophy of government Catherine worked hard to promote more or less obsolete. Absolute rule, no matter how progressive and humanitarian, became less preferable to a government that at least paid lip service to the will of the people. Enlightened despotism didn't disappear completely in the 19th century, especially in Russia, but the monarchies of Europe after the French Revolution would become more reactionary in nearly every way, with a couple of exceptions. Even the half-hearted, problematic progressivism of Catherine the Great would, in the years after the French Revolution, look like an open invitation to revolutionaries and anarchists, and in many ways, her legacy became stained and neglected. Join me next time as we step away from the royal courts and start looking at more everyday, less privileged people who contributed to the Enlightenment, starting with a young Jewish woman in Berlin. Goodbye.